Hello everyone and welcome back to day 44 of Bitwise where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. So last time we started dipping our toes into um, uh, some Python programming, uh, making domain embedded sp domain specific languages in Python. Um, and today I want to first review some of the um, tiny bit of hacking I did on this off stream and then continue where we left off. So, um, oh yeah, starting to using VS code for this, so I have to remember to switch over. So uh, if you recall, um, I mean, this is sort of a taster of things to come, but we have a simple logic language right now. Uh, just uh, the only type of data is a single bit. Um, and for now we just have as placeholder operations, we have and or, uh, XOR and not, uh, bitwise not. And, um, and then we have, you know, constant nodes and variable nodes and so on. And, um, you know, if you recall, this is sort of the stuff we did last time. So the thing that's different is last time we had an interpreter that basically would take a, uh, it would take an output node and it would do any evaluation required to compute the value of that uh, output node given an environment that assigns values for all the inputs. So if you have, um, for example, an output, which is like X, X uh, you know, X and Y, and X and Y are marked as variables, um, then you say, you know, uh, evaluate that given that X is true and and uh, Y is false, and it would do that. Uh, we had kind of hard-coded the recursive traversal for that. Um, and as I started doing some more work, um, I realized, excuse me, it would be useful to factor out a bunch of the um, kind of the dispatch logic for that, because not only would it be required in you know uh, an evaluator, but also in all kinds of other uh, transformation and uh, transformations and analyses you'd want to do on a graph like that. So um, that's what I did. So this is uh, this here is basically the evaluator from last time, and um, so uh, it, it inherits just as a way to mix in some functionality. Inherit, inherits from a visitor. This is not really a visitor in the normal OO sense, but serves a similar purpose. Um, but what you do is you pass in uh, you pass in an environment which assigns uh, values to the uh, variables. Uh, and uh, it initializes sort of a, a value mapping from that. And then it just uh, basically recursively um, visits, um, you know, starting with the, the initial node or set of nodes you want to evaluate, it recursively visits them to compute their values. And uh, the way it works is um, uh, the visitor overloads the double underscore call method. So um, this is if you try to use a visitor instance as a function, basically, this gets called, uh, and you can see what it does is it has this uh, this dictionary which holds a set of computed values, initially empty, um, and when you call it, it always first tries to look up if to see whether that value has or, or whether that node has already been assigned a value, uh, and if it has, then it falls through here. Um, but then there's two cases where, in some sense, it doesn't have a, a, a complete value. In one case, and by the way, this is stuff we've seen before when we did the resolver, for example, or the type completion stuff in the ion compiler. Um, if the value in this dictionary is marked as visiting, which is just a sentinel value that just says, hey, we haven't actually computed the value yet, and somehow you ended up recursing back to itself. And so uh, that raises an exception. Otherwise, if it hasn't been visited before, then um, based on the type of the node, or rather the, based on the name of the type of the node, we find a dispatch method uh, if one exists and otherwise dispatching to this default method uh, and just call that and uh, put it put its result in this dictionary mapping so that future calls to ask for that node's value will hit that. Um, and the reason we need to do that is because um, we have essentially abstract, abstract syntax graphs rather than abstract syntax trees. So a node can be visited multiple times. Uh, it's not just like a normal AST where uh, each node can only be visited once. Um, so that's why we need this kind of cache uh, to make sure that we only evaluate something once. Uh, and as I explained last time, the reason for that is not just as an optimization to avoid reevaluating values, but in some cases that will show in a sec, it's really important to preserve identity so that you don't, um, I mean, for example, if you're trying to copy a graph, um, you want to make sure a node is only copied once, right? You want to retain uh, identity when you're copying. And so this kind of thing helps for that. So anyway, um, so last time we were doing that kind of dispatch logic manually, and now here it's very simple-minded. We have the setup uh, code to initialize 
the value mapping for the variables. So only the variables are filled in, but nothing else is filled in. And then we just say for the different node types using the name of the class we want to dispatch on, uh, what to do with it. So constant node, we say we just want the node value, which is a constant. For binary node, we use the um, the node operator, which for now is just a string as a, as a tag. We look up into this dictionary mapping to find a lambda, which takes, uh, it doesn't take the left and right nodes as arguments, it takes the left and right values. So this what this function here, aside from doing the dictionary lookup, is responsible for is it recursively evaluates the left and right operands and then passes those values to this, you know, wh whatever appropriate lambda is in this table. Um, so this is just implementing the runtime semantics of, of these logic uh, functions. And same for unary, same idea. And then you can see here, if you want to evaluate node, construct an evaluator from the initial environment and then just call it. And this self call here is just, you know, the same thing as when, when it's calling this, right? It's just uh, essentially calling into this, uh, this magic method. For handling function calls. So that's the evaluator, that's what we had last time, but now I have a bunch of examples of how to use the visitor for other stuff. Um, here is here's a very basic thing that doesn't really seem to do much, but um, uh, with a few modifications will be very useful. So here's a way to copy, this is like a deep copy of, um, of a node graph, and you can see that it doesn't really do much, it just basically, you know, for each of these uh, class, classes, it just calls the corresponding constructor um and uh for some of the arguments it just passes them in because they're they don't need to be copied explicitly because they're kind of immutable uh like integers and strings are immutable you don't need to do some kind of copy operation explicitly but then for these other things that are themselves nodes we recursively copy them and then hook them up uh, and then again we have this front end method um and uh, this will be useful. I'll show an example right after I, I finish explaining this new stuff. Uh, you can use this kind of thing to make substitutions. So suppose, for example, you have a graph and it uses certain operators that are not available in a certain target language. Uh, like we talked about before when we were talking about assembly, how sometimes we have to lower from a higher level language to a lower level language because certain operations are missing. And uh, I'll show in a sec how you can expand this copier to do substitution. So for example, suppose your target language has and and or, but it doesn't have XOR. Then we want to uh, make a transformation visitor that basically copies everything, except if it sees an XOR, it replaces it by, you know, no, uh, ands and ors and so on. Um, again, not in place, but making a new copy because um, much, it's much easier to do things that way rather than trying to rewire things in place. So um, I'll show how to expand this copier to do that in a sec. Here's a more interesting thing. This is uh, the first part of a compiler. So if you remember what we did in the evaluator, uh, we're traversing everything. Um, like basically the compiler is trying to treat some, some the, the interpreter treats everything as dynamic. It treats the graph structure itself that it's evaluating as dynamic and it treats the you know, the initial values for the variables is dynamic. So everything here is fully dynamic. But in a lot of cases, you know, as with a compiler in general, the program itself is static, but the inputs are dynamic, right? So, um, and, and so uh, you want to be able to sort of compile the structure of the graph into some sort of representation that can be efficiently executed for different inputs, but that, but that has otherwise been pre-processed for the specific graph structure. So here's a step one of that, and I'll show you how to use that uh, for a compiler in a sec. But basically what this does is it just linearizes a, uh, a graph and um, by producing a flat sequence of instructions, and again, this is pretty similar to stuff we've seen before because it's basically the same sort of thing we do for the uh, resolver in ION because there too, we're interested in linearizing and sorting a set of, um, you know, in ION, we're sorting a set of declarations uh, so that when we generate our C code, um, you know, things are sorted correctly. Um, in this case, uh, we do something similar. We uh, want to make sure that, um, any time we use a result, that result has already been computed. So we have a, a sorted sequence, a topologically sorted sequence of instructions. Um, and so there's really not much to it. For most of these things, like take the binary node as an example. Um, to linearize a binary operator node, we linearize the left operand and the right order and in that order. And when we call these uh, functions recursively, they're responsible for returning a variable name, a, temp a temporary variable name that contains the result of evaluating that node. And so we get those names for the left and right operands. Then we make a new name for ourselves to hold our result. 
and then we append a single instruction corresponding to that binary operator and you can see it really just specifies you know the destination name what operator to use for that computation and then the left and right operand names and then we return that name and it's a sort of the same thing for all of those um, this make name function just has a global counter or global for the linearizer um, that assigns sequential IDs to all the different nodes. And um, in the case of a variable node, the base name, like the name basically consists of a base name and then the, uh, you know, this incrementing ID. And for uh, nodes that have an explicit name, which right now is only variables, their base name comes from the name attribute of that node. But otherwise, you just get T, T for temp as the uh, base name. Um, and that's basically it. And so um, I have some examples. Let me just show some examples of this running. Um, can't remember if this is the first one. This one's a little bit smaller. It's probably better. So um, still a little bit complicated. Maybe I can do something even simpler. Um, I'll just do it at the end. So we don't have to. But yeah, suppose you. Um, Suppose you linearize, um, you know, I don't know, something like something like this. Um, all right, I keep forgetting when Python three, where print is no longer an operator but a function. So yeah, um, so when you linearize this expression here, x xord with not y and z. Um, you get a list of things back and uh, you get a, a three tuple back and the first element of the tuple is the variable name containing the final result of this expression and then the second part is a, a set of all the inputs that ultimately the output were dependent on so you can see in this case that was x y and z um, so it will tell you exactly what inputs you need to pass in in order to uh, evaluate uh, this graph uh, and then after that, you have the linearized set, set of instructions. So you can see, first it computes x0 by reading from the variable x, computes y1 by reading from the variable y. Then it computes t2, which is temporary, by negating y1. Um, then it loads c3 by reading from c, computes t4 temporary by anding t2 and, t, and c3, and so on. So it finishes that. And finally, it produces t5, which is our final result, uh, and that's it. So um, this is a linearizer. This is this produces something akin to single assignment form, but you can see there's no control flow. It's just a linear list of instructions. But the important thing is everything, rather than having a pointer structure where the pointers are kind of how things are linked up, you have these explicit string IDs, and things have been sorted explicitly. So they're um, uh, you know the results are computed before they're needed, basically. So um, you can probably imagine how you can easily compile this to pretty much anything, any target language. And as a result, um, I decided to just do a simple, uh, a simple mini compiler that compiles from a syntax graph to Python code. And so really all it does is takes a set of nodes. Um, this is if you want to compute multiple results at once, which is usually needed. Uh, you know, for example, one of my, uh, cases here is you have a full adder which computes both a sum bit and a carry bit so from three input bits it produces two output bits and so often you want to compute those together that's why you pass in not a single output node but a set of output nodes or a sequence of output nodes um, but anyway so the way it works is you first you linearize the set of nodes and so you get the set of outputs inputs and instructions uh, and then I just generate some Python code I turn each of the instructions into a Python statement where you simply, you know, you create a uh, an assignment um, where the right hand side is, you know, just corresponds is the Python code corresponding to the um, to the kind of instruction here. So variable const unary operator binary operator, um, and then it just generates a little uh, definition stub here, uh, and it returns a tuple of the results um, that you wanted. And it has, and it's it's a function where the inputs basically, the parameters to the function are the inputs that are ultimately required to um, to compute the outputs. So you can see um, this here is a set of parameters, and this is the set of outputs that are returned. Um, and then I just exec that dynamically at runtime, and I grab the function. And so um, to take our example from before, um, if I uh,
if I take this thing here, uh, I guess let me assign it to a variable. Um, if you do something like this, right now I have a debug print. Oh, I can see there's a small bug with the spacing. Um, um, but uh, yeah, so this is just debug output, but this is just the code it generates from compiling it. So you can see it infers that ultimately the expression depends on X, Y, and Z. It doesn't necessarily preserve the order. Um, you know, I mean, you, I guess you could if you wanted to, but you generally you should expect to pass in uh, parameters and inputs using uh, keyword arguments rather than positional arguments. Um, so for example, at this point, you could just do, you know, you could do something like this. Um, and uh, so let me just think was, so I guess if we make this true, this should flip the polarity. So this is true now. Um, but yeah, so so at this point we really have like every time we evaluate f for a new set of inputs, unlike the original evaluator, we not, we're not retraversing the graph structure and building another you know a dictionary to cache everything. All that work has already been done um, basically by the linearizer, and then the compiler um, just uh, built the code corresponding to to the uh, linearized output, and so. You know, this is a toy example for now, but uh, I just wanted to show some examples of the kind of stuff you can easily do with this kind of approach. Um, and of course, uh, the, the reason I'm, I'm computing Python code is because if you wanted to compute, say, C code or assembly code, it would require more tool chain. Uh, but because Python is dynamic, it's very easy to generate this code and then evaluate it from within itself. Uh, so that was just a convenient thing to do. But this kind of code is obviously very basic and you can target it to pretty much anything in the world, right? Like you can generate C code or even assembly code directly very easily um, because this is, the, you know, the linearized output is basically assembly code. It just has a lot of registers. So it's not register allocated. But other than that, it's totally flattened uh, and ready for that sort of low level targeting. Um, so that was one thing. Um, the other thing, uh, I wanted to show is kind of an analysis, so not really a transformation. So the other stuff is kind of a transformation. You know, an evaluator is transforming from um, from a set of of nodes to um, you know to an output value. The copier is transforming from one graph to the other, and the linearizer is transforming from a. I, I guess even this thing I'm about to show you can be looked as a transformation as well if you generalize it like that. But it's a little bit. It feels a little bit different. Um, it's basically just computing. It's measuring a graph. Um, but it's not turning it into another graph or anything like that. But I guess you could look at it as sort of a transformation. But anyway, um, this is kind of a toy version of something you do a whole lot in hardware design where um, you're trying to compute the maximum delay from an input to an output. So, um, you know, I'm not going to explain the whole background here. I'll cover that later when we do a more ordered introduction to hardware stuff. But basically, um, you know, you think about why certain chips can be clocked at higher rates than others. Um, I remember when I was younger, I thought it just had to do with the crystal oscillator itself. Like somehow it, could, it couldn't be uh, clocked at a higher rate, but that's obviously not the reason. Um, I think even back in the 70s, I'm sure you could build very high frequency oscillators uh, with, with not much of an issue. Uh, although maybe I'm wrong about that. But anyway, the fundamental chip design reason why things can't be clocked higher is essentially that you know, um, there's a certain amount of work basically that has to be completed each clock cycle, um, right? And so um, it's kind of like an assembly line or something like that, where there's a fixed cadence of things coming through, and if one part of the uh, of the line can't keep up, then you get garbage, right? Like a uh, catastrophic, fairly catastrophic failure. And so the way you deal with that is you do static timing analysis, uh, where you statically ahead of time you try to say you know, um, if an input at this point comes in, how long does it take uh, along the worst case path, the critical path, how long does it take for uh, the result to propagate down to an output uh, where things have to be stable before the next cycle comes around? And so that's the maximum delay. Um, and so here I have a visitor that basically computes maximum delay for a given graph. 
and uh, it's pretty parameterized. Um, so basically, um, there's a default function you can pass in called get default delay, but you can pass in any function you want to specify uh, what delays should be assigned to different kinds of, uh, of primitive nodes, like you know XOR versus AND and stuff like that. Um, and so here's the way it works. Um, you pass in, as always, you pass in a, a set of nodes that are the outputs you want to measure delay to. Um, and um, what it does is for every, for every node, it computes a mapping which says, um, what is the maximum delay to this other input node? So for example, um, the primitive case, the base case of the recursion is variable node. And variable node has a delay of zero to itself. So the fact that there's an entry at all for node means that this node has a path to whatever the key is in this dictionary. So you know a node has a path to itself. That's kind of a trivial statement. Uh, and that path has delay zero because there's so far nothing uh, nothing there. Uh, you could add some actual delay here as well if you wanted. And in real chips, there's often, I mean, you could model it as, I don't know, the clock to out delay or something like that for a flip flop. But here I'm just saying zero to keep it kind of simple. Um, constant nodes can have, it returns an empty dictionary because it has nothing reachable, right? Like it bottoms out in a constant. So there's no inputs um, that it depends on. It's just fully self self contained. And then for these other nodes, um, it's the same kind of recursive approach we've done before. Let's do unary first since it's easier. So first, based on the node type, we look up using this function that was provided, we look up what the propagation delay is for this specific node. So right now we only have the um, we only have the uh, not uh, you know binary not node, and the delay might be you know like how long it takes if if a uh, if, if an input changes to a, a NOT gate, how many nanoseconds or picoseconds does it take before the output of the NOT gate has fully stabilized in a, in a way that's consistent with that changed input? So that's how you should interpret that. But you can also just look at it abstractly as a mathematical thing. But if you want to think of it in terms of, of chip stuff, uh, that's roughly what it corresponds to. Um, but anyway, so that depends on the node. And then what we do is we recursively visit the operand of that unary operator. And so that's going to give us this dictionary, which is you know, a table specifying the max delay to, a, to some set of, of inputs. And so for each of them, we uh, this is quite simple. We really just add uh, the propagation delay for the not gate uh, or whatever other unary gate is in play here. We add that to the max delay for that uh, input target, uh, you know, and that's it. So we really just build a new dictionary where we add the propagation delay for this, uh, for this gate or this node to um, the max delay through um, through the operand. Um, so that's that's hopefully uh, simple. Here's something a little bit more complicated. Um, with a binary node, you have two input operands, and so you have to consider paths through either of those input uh, either of those operands. And so as before, um, we compute um, the delay associated with this node type. And um, the important thing to note is that for a binary node, there's two delays. Um, because um, it's not so important for the, the, the gate types we have right now are you know and or and XOR and those are quite symmetric and so probably these are always going to be the same for those but there are other you know quote unquote gate types or primitive cells like a multiplexer for example where um, the nature of the different inputs are fundamentally different and they usually have a different delay associated with them uh, and so that can capture that kind of cost model but uh, for, for the stuff we're doing right now you can just assume that left and right are the same delay um, but anyway so we start by recursively computing um, the delay through the left operand and this is really just the same as uh, what we did here if you look at it um, but then we have to do something additional because there's also a right operand. And so what we do is there's two cases. We iterate over everything that's reachable through the right operand. And if something is also reachable through, but it, it, this case here handles uh, when something is reachable through both the left operand and the right operand, in which case we want to take the max over to the two possibilities. So if if through, I mean, let me, let me give you an example. Suppose you have something like this. So X is a variable node, so it's an, an input. Suppose you have something like this. Um, suppose you have something like this. Um, then, uh, basically, 
Uh, if you look at from, from from the vantage point of this top level AND gate, X is reachable through both of the left operand and the right operand. But clearly the delay through the right operand is higher. So for example, um, I guess the delay through the left operand would be zero because uh, because of this. Um, and the delay through the right operand would be, for example, one, assuming we assign a delay of one to the to the unary node, uh, not. Um, and so here we have, uh, you know, x x has through the left branch has a delay of zero, through the right branch has a delay of one, and so the overall max delay for x should be one because we don't care. Actually, it can be useful to compute min delay too. Um, uh, that's sometimes called the contamination delay. Um, but uh, for now, we're just computing max delay, and so we don't. The, the fact that we can reach it, quite, you know, th that there's a shorter delay through this, is not so pertinent. We only care about the max delay because that's what we have to um, worry about when we're figuring out how quick we can clock our circuit. So that's the idea behind this check here. Um, but if but if it isn't, uh, but if this node that's reachable from the right operand was never reachable through the left operand, then we just add it directly. Um, so this is kind of like a union of of what's reachable across the left and right operands, but if, if something is reachable through both operands, we have to combine them with this max operator. So that's the idea. Um, and again, for now, we just have um, this default delay, which assigns a delay of one to everything. But you could assign, you know, per node type, like you know, XOR, for example, um, is going to be longer delay than uh, than other things. And so that's the kind of thing you could uh, put in your cost model here in this callback, and it would uh, it would just work. Um, so yeah, I, I futzed around with this stuff off stream. Um, let me just see. All right. Let me just see if there's questions and then I'll dive into the thing I want to do next. Um, boom, 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 boom. All right. So, um, uh, let me show you how right now we were, um, Let's see, I remember all my hotkeys for VS. Um, I was mentioning earlier that the copier right now is kind of trivial, um, but uh, it's kind of a good template for how to do more interesting graph transformations. So let me uh, let me show how to do that. Um, let me show how to do substitutions uh, where we're essentially lowering from, you know, for example, suppose we want to get rid of XOR, we want to replace XOR with an equivalent graph that has just uh, and or and not or something like that. So um, I'm just going to keep this as is and then I'm going to make a new thing. And um, maybe after here. Um, and I don't know what to call it. Uh, lower, it's a terrible name. Um, or legalizer. Gah. Let's call it a transformer. Um, I don't know. Let's hard code it. Let's call it the XOR remover. Very specific. Um, so basically, we're going to have something like this. Um, um, where we're just, uh, and this is just a toy case. I wanted to illustrate it. You can easily generalize this so you can specify. You know, you can have a user specified mapping of what to replace with what or whatever. But um, let, me, let me do it like this for now. So um, suppose we want to write this thing that takes a graph and it removes all the XORs and replaces them with, um, like I said, some equivalent uh, and an OR based thing. So um, for, for these things, we just want to still copy them because again, we don't want to, um, we, we want to make a complete fresh graph, uh, not you know reusing nodes from the old graph, at least for now. Um, and so unary, let's say we're not replacing anything here, but then for XOR, we want to do something new. And um, what I'm going to do is, um, so first off, let's just, and I, this is probably not the optimal way of, of expressing XOR, um, but uh, let's see. One thing you can do is you can say, um, um, XOR is the same as OR, um, but um, they can't both be one. Um, I think that's right. So this this AND here is one if and only if both of them are one. Otherwise, it's zero. So if 
uh, if either of them is not one, then this is zero, and then not zero is one, and anding with one does nothing. But um, if both are one, then this is one, and so this is zero, and so the whole thing is zero. So I think that's right. So that's not, I'm sure this is probably not how you do it. And incidentally, in real chips, you never implement XORs like this. You use um, transistor, what is it, pass transistor logic with multiplexers and stuff like that. We will talk about that later. But um, for now, given what we have available, this would be one substitution, certainly. And so um, here's a very simple way of doing it. Um, I, incidentally, one bad way of doing this transformation would be to sort of write, okay, I'm going to directly trans, you know, I'm going to directly uh, do something like this, and I'm going to have some terribly nested, um, you know, constructor uh, code. But you can just use all the syntactic shorthands we already have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, first of all, whatever whatever transformation I make, I'm going to recursively um, I'm going to recursively remove XORs in that as well, right? Um, and actually, let me just um, break out. Um, um, let's just break this out because I think we'll need it in either case. Um, So we share this code. Uh, we can also just make that check a little bit uh, simpler. Uh, and then what we want to do is what was it, what, what did we say? So it's the same as left. Uh, it's the same as this, except we want something like that. Um, I think that should work. And so um, as an initial test, you can do. Let's just take a top level expression where um, we're just, um, just have a single level XOR here. Okay. So that looks correct to me. Um, and, um, and then we want to have something, I guess, uh, fancier like nested, like if you do this, for example, um, you know, that should be transformed, but also if I then have something like, um, I don't know, something like this, that should also be handled. Uh, incidentally, one thing that's not visible in this um, text representation, um, show that one thing that's not visible in this text representation is that um, this sub expression here um, you can see it gets replicated in the XOR substitution in two places say same with y right but especially this compound expression and again this is why we have to be careful about preserving referential integrity uh, we're not copying those two things independently because um, if you look at what we do up here, we recursively, you know, copy and replace the left and right operands, and then we we reference the results of that substitution multiple times. But these are not independent copies; these are references to the same thing. So even though here it looks like they're, you know, you can't tell the difference between uh, X and not C being independent copies versus being two references to the same copy, but um, let me. I guess we can dig into. Um, let's see. Right. Um, I guess we can also actually just use the debugger. I guess. Uh, I don't know actually if. Uh, I don't know if we can see identity easily in the debugger. doesn't look like it um, but basically well we can at least figure out what to look at so it's e dot right dot left dot left so well I, we can do it here actually um, so e dot left dot 
or sorry, e dot right dot left dot left is is being the pointer check. E dot right dot right dot operand dot left. So you can see this is true. So so those two thing uh, these two things here are not independent copies, they're the same thing. Um, which also means that when you're doing these substitutions, you're not you're not kind of exploding you're, you're, I mean, like again, this substitution may not be the best one, but um, we're at least not exploding, you know, just because the sub expression operands are compound, we're not exploding the size of the total graph or whatever, um, which is nice. But anyway, that XOR remover is kind of a dumb example, but you can kind of imagine how if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to target different target languages, you know, and then by languages, I, I'm speaking in generality like it could be you know something for chips or whatever it could be gate level in which case if you want to do something like this um, you have a standard cell library of whatever primitives are available and you want to map onto them um, um, but uh, but for other things you just want to pass them through unaltered uh, and so that's the kind of thing you can easily do with this approach so pretty handy um, all right Um, all right, what's a good thing to show next? Um, I want to start, like, I think next time. So today is, today is Friday for me. So uh, I, I think next time we will start on sort of the final version of a lot of the ideas that I'm demo demoing here. But um, so I'm just going to show some random stuff today. And then next time we'll sort of start working on the real thing, which will be uh, a little more, um, will be a little more forward looking in terms of uh you know the features i, I know we're going to need for the uh, for the hardware description language and stuff but uh but anyway one uh, one thing um that might be fun to show is um i guess one 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 reason it's nice to have something like uh like python as an embedded uh, what one reason it's nice to have an embedded domain specific language in a real language like python Rather than, for example, in Verilog, you can do certain kind of meta programming kind of things, uh, but it tends to be pretty limited. Verilog itself is not a very nice language. Um, th this is going to be a trivial example of something you also could have done in, in Verilog, but uh, I'll, I'll just demo it as a kind of taster. But um, all right, I think I already have a full adder somewhere. So uh, here's a full adder. Um, a full adder takes. Um, Three bits and computes two output bits, so it's what's called a two, you know, sometimes called a two to three, a three to two compressor. Um, and so the first part of the result is the XOR, which corresponds to the um, it corresponds to the bitwise, um, you know, it corresponds to the sum bit. And then this thing over here, which again is not an optimal, it's not the optimal way way to write um, the carry, but this is the carry basically. So uh, even though this is, I intentionally wrote this so that X, Y, and Z all look like they're kind of the same thing. Um, but typically you think of one of these inputs as being a carry and you think the other two of being kind of the sum bits from, you know, two integers or whatever, two base two integers you're adding. Um, but actually this whole thing is symmetric and uh, that's why people call it a three to two compressor. It really just takes sort of three, three operands and compress them into two operands. Um, but uh, let me uh, let, let me show you how you can build a um, an adder like a n bit adder from this stuff, and then I'll show you how to test it, which is uh, kind of where the meta language stuff is helpful. Um, all right, so um, suppose so we have this full adder. Um, let's make uh, make adder, and I'm going to um, I'm going to take n as the width of the thing we're trying to create, and um, um, and 
later on we will have rather than doing things manually this way we will actually have data types that are not just individual bits but that are full bit vectors um, but for today i just wanted to show you how you can even with just individual bits is the only thing you can really work with at the object language level how using meta language features like what python can do for you you can still kind of manage the complexity pretty decently and so um, what i'm going to do is i'm going to create um, a vector essentially a vector of arguments uh, based on um, based on this width that's passed in and so it's going to be something like this um, and i'm going to do the same thing for um, for y um, and um, and so here we have basically two bit vectors and again, the, the list here is at the Python level. It's not at the graph level. Um, and now I want to make an adder, which, you know, given, given if you provide values for X and Y, all these different bits, it will compute the corresponding sum bits. Um, and the way I'm going to do this, well, you could start with a half adder, um, but actually let's do it this way. Uh, I'm going to have yet another input that's going to be CI for carry in. Um, and then I'm going to do the following. <clears throat> um, I'm going to have a uh, initially an empty bit vector. I'm just going to build it up bit by bit. And here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to add the ith bit of x and, and y. And I'm going to pass in the carry as the third um, as the third operand. Like I said, that's typically how a full adder is used, even though if you look at the logic expression, it's actually symmetric in all of the three operands. But so this is computing, you know, the sum of x and y and the carry, which comes from the previous bit. And so there's a, an initial uh, input carry, which comes from the outside, but then otherwise, basically, the way we're doing this, you'll note that C is C occurs both on the right hand side and the left hand side. Uh, in the right hand side, it's the carry in, and on the right hand side, it's the carry out. But um, the point is that the the carry out from the previous step becomes the carry in of the next step, and so that's why we're kind of chaining C through this computation. But that's basically it, uh, and then you have to, um, well. I could write it like this. Um, let, let's just make an empty vector of nuns. Um, so we just make a, a vector that's initially empty, just has placeholder values. Um, but then we fill them in. I, I, you could do it by doing incremental appends, but doing it this way kind of, in my mind, has the benefit that um, it has the benefit that this expression here is pretty nice to look at, I guess. Uh, you can kind of see exactly what's going on. Uh, and then what we return is we return x. Um, so x is a vector. Uh, and the way the compiler works is that if you return a, a tuple of things, you know, it's interpreted as a set of outputs we want to compute. Uh, and actually, we can look at C itself. We could, we, we could either look at uh, the carry as an extra bit in Z, um, which is maybe useful to do. And which, so let's just do that. Um, so then we return a single vector, which, so in other words, if X and Y have N bits, C has N plus one bits because of the final carry. Um, and there's also an initial uh, carry in. Um, maybe I'll just call it C there uh, for the carry in. Um, so anyway, so this is uh, a single, a simple adder here. Um, and so if I call this for any particular value, like like two, um, I should be able to print it, assuming I didn't screw up. I have to remove that breakpoint. Um, actually, let's start with one, just so we can see what's going on more easily. So for one, you can see it's really just one one copy of the. Um, it's one copy. Of the um, of the full adder, which is what you'd expect, because that's what it is. Like that is that is what um, what a one bit adder is. It's just essentially just a full adder. Um, but then if you uh, pass in two, now 
you have uh, something that gets progressively more complex. For the first bit, we have the same thing as before. For the second bit, you have the two bits XORed with the carry from the previous step. Um, and then you have the ultimate output carry, like this is the, the overall output carry. Um, and again, uh, not the best way to do some of this stuff, but but anyway, this expression looks longer than it really is because it's a graph, not a tree, right? So some things are computed only once and the result is reused. Like this x, a, 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 you know, x, x zero and y zero is only computed once, and so you see multiple copies of it. This whole thing looks bigger than it really is in terms of the graph structure. Just want to emphasize that. But anyway, and so you you could do you could do this for bigger numbers too. Okay, um, now let's try to. Um, Let's try to um, well let, let let's try to make an eight bit adder. And this thing is probably going to be pretty huge. So this is a pretty pretty large circuit, right? Um, and um, let's compile it. Um, So we have to pass in, pass in the whole adder. The adder is a sequence of things. We want to compute all of the output bits, right? Um, maybe I'll just call it add. And so here is, uh, and here you can see the reuse. But here's the adder, and this it printed the code. You can see the output bits. Um, the inputs are not ordered in any particular way. Um, I may actually want to. Uh, have a way to specify the order here, but we don't need to. It's easy enough to just pass them as keyword arguments um, by adding a little front end, basically. But um, but here you can see what's going on. Um, it, is, it fully flattened this expression, and you can also see all the reuse of everything. Um, and then let's uh, um, let's. Uh, for, well, maybe let's uh, first off let's make a front end here. Um, um, oops, sorry. And now I want to uh, add our front end, or whatever, or maybe I'll just call it F. Um, so here I want to do a front end, and the front end is going to um, basically it assumes an x and y are um, are integers. So what, so basically this front end is going to just wrap. It's going to wrap a Python integer. Uh, on, on both input and output. So if I pass in, in uh, Python integers, it's going to turn it into a bit vector that it feeds to the circuit and evaluates. And then on the output, it's going to do the same thing. Does that make sense? So um, this is really just a way to be able to use it um, for Python easily. And then we're going to test it using brute force and comparing, uh, comparing this, checking that it does the right thing, hopefully. And so um, I guess the first thing you can do is you can um I don't know. Um maybe call this X's. So um for I in range N basically what we're going to do is we're going to uh, well, I guess we can do it different ways. Um yeah, let's do this. Let's just replace x with its, you know, we're going to overwrite this binding with its bit vector representation. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, shift it left by i places and then and it. So that gives a single bit. Um, you know, and you could, uh, could do something like this if you wanted, although we should do that ourselves. Don't have to. That's done in the compiler. We shouldn't have to do it. Um, and so uh, we do this. Uh, 
Um, and then we should be able to, well, I guess one, this is where it's a little bit awkward, but um, we can do it. Um, this is definitely not the optimal way to do it, but you can do this. Um, so we know all the arguments are called things like, you know, x0, x0 through whatever. And so um, you can do um, you can do something like this. And actually, we can just, uh, now that I think about it, we, we don't have to uh, override. We don't have to make the vector. We can just do that stuff here. Um, and so we could do that. Um, and then we'll just call that f with those arguments and uh, now we're going to get back the thing we're going to get back is going to be ordered that's always the same order of things we pass into the compiler is going to be produced in the return values and so um, I think what you do is um, well It's going to do be um, result i um, plus two times c, something like that. Just basically taking the individual bits and building up the integer. Um, So let's see, see how that works. Let's start with just one, just to make sure if something goes wrong, we can check. Um, so here I should be able to pass in like zero and zero. You know what, let's just, um, even though the structure has a input carry. Let's just hardwire the input carry to zero, um, just to make it more like a Python style adder. Uh, unsupported operand. Oh, this should be okay. So. Um, So let's just make a table from tabulating this thing. Um, um, x, y, adder, x, y. So this looks correct, right? Because one plus one, there's an output carry, but we're intentionally ignoring the output carry um, for this for this front end wrapper. Um, but uh, if we now do two bits, let's see if it does something reasonable. This definitely doesn't look reasonable. If this is wrong. Um, because it could be wrong in different ways. Um, okay, this is going to be fun to debug. It's probably something stupid. Let me just eyeball the, the code here first. Um, I 
Okay, I just wanted to make sure that it was actually getting those positional arguments as expected. Now for this thing here, um, let's just look at the output code it generates. So it outputs um, three bits. Maybe do Oh, we want to output all of those. Um, yeah, I guess we could do that. In 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 that case, you should really just do, um, do like this, I suppose. Yeah, no, one plus one equals zero, is fine. Um, if you're doing things modulo, whatever, right, uh, without the carry. But um, anyway, let, let, yeah, we we can do this too. That's fine. Um, then it's lossless at least. But yeah, uh, anyway, the the so let's let's look at this code to see what if anything went wrong. X zero, X one, and one. Yeah, I mean this is fine too. Either way, I'm I'm okay with this. Um, so let's see. Boom, boom, boom. Let me make sure this is actually reasonable. First output is the sum, second is the carry. X and Y, or X and C, or Y and C. So if at least, this is basically checking if at least two bits are set, then there is a carry. Um, okay, let's look at this again. You know what, let's just make, uh, let, let's just uh, hardwire this C, this, since we're not really using it for anything anyway. Um, and then we should get a complaint about that keyword argument. I mean, that is not going to be the issue, but just want to take that out of consideration. Um, let me just check the bits to make sure the conversion is at least correct. Yeah, so that is four. Um, is this conversion correct? That looks correct. Um, hmm. So it's claiming that 
third bit is that um, So the third bit is T20. This is the ultimate carry. Hmm. Oh, you're right. Um, um, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, this is the other way around. Thanks for that catch. I'm so used to doing this kind of loop for parsing, but you're absolutely right. Um, you are 100% right. Thank you, sir. So yeah, he's saying that this loop for reconstructing the integer from the bit vector is wrong because this is treating and uh, treating it as if it's most significant bit first, which is how it is if you're parsing, like you know, you're parsing an integer. Um, so let, let's see. I guess the easiest way is to just do it like this. Well, here's the other thing you can do, which is more explicit. You can just say um, b uh, b shifted to position uh, b shifted to position i. So then you're directly you're directly shifting each bit into its uh, proper position. Um, like that. Okay. All right. So this looks correct, just for eyeballing. Uh, and now we could make an actual test. Like we could say assert x plus y equals adder x y. And you can see that didn't fail. I mean, and if I did something, I don't know, if I did something like this just to verify that it's actually executing. So you can see this is working correctly. And now um, let's do it for 8 bits. Let's do it for, um, well, for, so, so this, I guess this is funny. There are certain kinds of parametric functionality where if it, if you test it for like a very small bit width, you kind of have almost perfect confidence that it works for any width because there's no real there's no real width it treats specially really. Um, but anyway, so you can see we, we can test it with um, we can probably do we can do this. This is going to take a little bit longer because it's for, uh, on the order of four billion iterations. Oh, it actually was still executing before. Wait, it was executing that long even for, I guess because it's doing all of this stupid stuff with, um, okay, so it's still running. I think that it's because there's what, the 64,000 iterations and um it's at a breakpoint it's just really slow but let's finish uh, letting it run that will take i guess take a little bit of, of time this should execute the, the the reason this is slow is not because the circuit itself is slow like i mean sure it could be faster but like it's because we're doing all this stupid stuff for every single uh iteration um ideally you wouldn't do this right like there's no reason you have to do this if um it's kind of a side effect of the fact that we're not working directly with bit vectors but we have to kind of serialize things in and out um so it takes much longer to test even only 64,000 but anyway so uh this is an exhaustive test for 8 bit uh 8 bit uh addition All right. Um, I wonder if there's anything else I wanted to show today. Like I said, these two first two streams are just kind of demoing some basic stuff. 
uh, and then on Monday we start in a more structured way now that hopefully these ideas are not totally alien. Uh, I think that's maybe it for today. Let me just look. Like obviously a lot of this stuff here is, again, the reason this stuff is a little bit ugly when you want to make these things involving vectors is because the language itself does not have bit vector support, only individual bits. Uh, and so this is kind of trying to serve as a demo for um, for how you would do that sort of barehanded um, using, you know, using the host languages, in this case, Python support for vectors and stuff like that in order to, um, to do that for you uh, in a way that's not totally unreasonable, even though the language itself is very primitive and only had, has individual bits. And then kind of building all the serialization in and out of that awkward representation around it. So yeah, I think that's probably enough for today. It's not a super long stream, but um, seems about right. Um, so I think next time we'll dive into um, the HDL proper. Um, and it will be a lot of these same ideas, but with a more proper type system, you know, actual bit vectors and things like that. Um, and uh, modules and things like that as we as we proceed. But um, this is a, a taster of, of some of those ideas to come. So if people don't have questions, I'll just hang around for a few minutes and then I'll shut off the stream otherwise. And incidentally, like if you wanted to, like I think even for this compiler, I don't know if, if we could test that easily. Um, but if you wanted to do the same thing, but with the evaluator instead of the compiler, I guarantee you this is going to be like drastically slower. But yeah, hopefully this is pretty easy stuff so far, but I, I realized that everything else we've done so far has been like very straightforward C stuff. And so I just wanted to ease people into this Python, uh, all this Python stuff, which I mean, so far sh shouldn't be too crazy, but I think you can already see how it's it's kind of nice to just be able to to do things like this without like it's it's quite expressive and, and easy to prototype things. So anyway, I think that's it for today. Uh, see you next week. I, I plan to kind of in some sense restart, kind of like when we started on the ion stuff. I did some toy stuff with a calculator initially. I'm kind of trying treating this a little bit like that. So uh, next week we start on the more proper development of these concepts into a real language. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, should be good. Have a good weekend, everyone.